Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee meeting of the 19th of October 2021. First of all, um, item one on the agenda is apologies. I don't have any apologies unless anybody's got anything to. No? Okay. Um, oh. Yes, Councillor Jay, we haven't had an apology, but he may be on his way, so we'll just have to wait and wait and see. Um, on to item two, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 23rd of September. Hope you've all had opportunity to have a look at those. Have we got a, a mover and a seconder for those, please? Thank you. And all in favour? Thank you. Do we have two sets of minutes? Just one. Just the one for that. Thank you. Um, item three, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest for the items this evening? Councillor Hoople. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to declare a non-pecuniary interest um, as uh, Chair of Trustees of Heart of Tamworth, the charity which will be discussed later. Thank you for that, Councillor People. Um, with the approval of the committee, I'd like to move the agenda around slightly if, if we're all in agreement. Um, I'd like to bring forward item eight and item nine uh, and then revert back to the meeting revert back to item four after those two items can i ask if everybody's in agreement with that okay thank you very much so we'll move on to item eight uh, i'd like to welcome councillor alex farrell who's the portfolio holder for social housing and homeless prevention. Uh, Tina Mustafa, Assistant Director Neighbourhoods, and Sarah Finnegan, Head of Homelessness and Housing Solutions to the meeting. Um, the presentation which Tina and Sarah will be using will be available, is available on the agenda page for this meeting and on the website. So if I can hand over to Councillor Farrell to introduce the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, actually, and thank you for inviting me. Um, homelessness is a really important uh, item, something that we care very much about here in Tamworth. And of course, we're approaching winter, so now is a, a good as time as any to talk about it. Um, but before you hear from me, I'd love to have the presentation. So Tina, Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Councillor Farrell, and thank you, Chair, and good evening, councillors. Um, so for the benefit of the recording, my name's Tina Mustafa and I'm the Assistant Director of Neighbourhoods and have responsibility amongst other things for, for homelessness. Um, so delighted to present this report to you tonight. Um, first slide please, uh, Joe. So the outcomes that um, the portfolio holder and I discussed with the Chair of Scrutiny are to cover those three things for tonight. So um, we want to share with you um, some of the changes around the homelessness legislation and just talk to you around how, how that's defined and what are the obligations on us as a council to deliver that service. You know, a bit of a show and tell, to be fair. Um, the second outcome is to update you on progress through the Rough Sleeping Initiative. You may remember that we reported to Cabinet in July of this year on the successful allocation of £100,000 that we've been given by the government. Um, to prevent rough sleeping so we'll be sharing with you the progress on that um, and then the third thing was to talk to you about our winter relief arrangements um, which typically run from the 1st of December until the end of February um, and we'll be taking a report to Cabinet on the 11th of November um, in relation to those proposals so again to inform that discussion it's an opportunity to share those proposals with you and for you to inform um, that cabinet paper going forward. Um, so I think one thing just to say is there's a lot of detail in the presentation. You'll be glad to know that we're not going to read through it and go through every line, but what it does provide you with is a really good context and uh, backup information if you need it to help with your constituent inquiries. And obviously we'll take any questions tonight and 
you know you've we've shared with you previously our, all our contact details we're always happy to jump onto teams or have a quick telephone calls i know i did we cancel brindley earlier today and um, so we're always happy to do that um so please don't be put off by the information we will just spotlight it for you um so next slide please uh joe um so this is just really to sort of set the government sort of landscape um and context for you so as you know the uh, Ministry for Housing and Communities and Local Government is now the Department for Levelling Up and Housing and Communities. Um, portfolio holders um, were confirmed recently by the Prime Minister and we've seen a continuation of the Parliamentary Under Secretary for Rough Sleeping and Housing with Hedy Hughes. Um, and what we just want to say in terms of this sort of, um, I think, backdrop is that there's a continued focus from the government on homelessness and deterring and preventing rough sleeping. You'll remember through the pandemic, we shared various reports with you on the Everyone In initiative, um, and we were particularly proud of Tamworth's achievements because that we had you know, a zero count in terms of rough sleeping during that period. Um, and that's continued with only this week, um, the new department for levelling up and housing and communities have updated the homelessness code of guidance. Um, with new details around priority need. So it continues to be on the government's agenda and in focus, um, and there really is a drive um, around that. So next slide, please, Jo. Um, so in terms of the government's agenda around rough sleeping, again, we've shared this through various cabinet uh, meetings, particularly with the report that went on the 3rd of December last year on, the, on Tamworth's own housing and rough sleeping strategy um, but the context uh, for that is that the government's vision is around halving rough sleeping by 2022 and ending it by 2025 and there's links there that you can click on to take you to the government's agenda around that. Um, every local authority now has to produce its own rough sleeping and homelessness prevention strategy. As I said we reported ours to cabinet on the 3rd of December. Um, that piece of work was done in conjunction with sector experts um, in terms of sort of benchmarking across best practice. It was informed by a robust housing needs assessment so that our strategy could be intelligence led in terms of the focus around prevention. And it, the basically the strategy covers three core pillars if you like. One is around prevention, one is around intervention and um, stabilising often what is crisis or or um, difficult situations and then about recovery and how we you know move that between those three and um, so I think you know you you know and certainly the portfolio holder said in his his opening remarks that you know homelessness is an incredibly emotive subject um, it's a, a statutory responsibility for the council um, and we as a team are committed to supporting and tackling that and working with you um, as, as members around that. Um, we also have a responsibility to report up through the sort of government sort of uh, mechanisms through um, HAST, which that an acronym stands for, the Homelessness Advisory Support Team. We have regional representatives um, who are appointed by government, government, civil servants and ministers who meet with us on a monthly basis and who check in as part of our, our weekly and, and monthly returns on how we're doing as an organisation. So we are accountable to them um, and in fact they're due on site shortly to test and scrutinise some of our practices and casework around that. Uh, so next slide please. Uh, Joe, thank you. Again, this is really busy. When you've got the um, presentation on your own system, you'll be able to sort of zoom in so you can look at this detail in, 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 in a bit more time. But basically, this links to that housing needs data picture, which evidences our homelessness and rough sleeping picture. So there's two graphs there which are important. One details the amount of approaches we get with people who are presenting to us as homeless. Um, and the other one, uh, explains why people are becoming homeless so if I just sort of explain a bit about that in more detail um, so in terms of the service approaches to give you some sort of idea of the numbers this year we've got on a monthly basis between 44 and 86 people a month through or 44 or 86 households 
whether that's you know a single person or a, or a family composition who approach us to say they're homeless for one reason or another that varies month on month but it usually follows a pattern we usually see that spike uh, just after christmas for obvious reasons there's all sorts of um, family conflict isn't they around Christmas so you know we see spikes around January um, as we do around some other key events that are particularly linked to things like domestic violence when we see big football to tournaments we see a spike etc um, but by and large those figures are fairly static they're slightly up from last year which obviously the pandemic you know probably was a you know probably swayed, swayed those figures anyway but that's the sort of caseload that the teams are managing on a monthly basis the first point for us to make is that um, when we translate those presentations you know so those figures every month so potentially between four or five hundred to a thousand a year actually at any one time in the last two years we've only had single figures in temporary accommodation or bed and breakfast which really does show you that that's testament to the team working on prevention because what we our ambition is in the homelessness um, and rough sleeping strategy is to eliminate the use of crisis accommodation through b and and provide more settled um, and, and wider housing solutions to avoid people being in that situation but clearly um, you know if somebody rings us on a Friday night Saturday morning there is always going to be a need for emergency accommodation you know because properties don't just sit there waiting empty so we can never probably eradicate it altogether but that's definitely the ambition um, and certainly from the levels of presentations we get when we look at how they're managed that shows a very high success rate in terms of keeping that down um, there's also some detail on that around rough sleeping um, we have again got low figures around rough sleeping I was explaining earlier that rough sleeping is fits into two categories if you like one is transient so those people who are moving through um, but actually are probably in and out of settled accommodation as opposed to those people who are entrenched and who you know their lifestyle choice believe it or not is to rough sleep in that particular way in Tamworth we haven't got any ent entrenched rough sleepers what we've got is some transient rough sleepers and the rough sleeping count last year saw five yeah. um, and we have agreed with partners and other districts across Staffordshire that our next estimate for the rough sleeping count will be October the 30th which is tomorrow night uh, oh it's tomorrow night tomorrow apologies night. yes thank yeah. you Sarah yeah tomorrow night um, and obviously the outcome of that is a collaboration with all our partners in the voluntary sector to agree the numbers where, where they're actually rough sleeping on a transient basis and that gets submitted to the government but again those figures are sing that those numbers are low they're single figures and again that's testament to the prevention work we do and we'll talk to you later about um, the work we're going to be doing with partners and in terms of some of the rough sleeping initiative grant funding and how we're going to target that there so that's in terms of some of the the, the 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 numbers in terms of presentation in terms of why people are homeless i know you can't see some of the the detail on that slide on the right hand graph but if as you blow it up later at your leisure you'll see there are a whole range of categories why people are homeless and obviously we did a lot of work behind the homelessness strategy to look at causation um, yeah it's the other one on the right hand side Joe that's brilliant thank you very much um, yeah that's great um, we did a lot of work to inform the, the homelessness and rough sleeping strategy on why people are homeless because if we can understand the causation then we can put strategies and plans in place to try and address that so as you can see I can tell you um, from memory that the, the biggest areas of why people are rough sleeping is because they're being asked to leave by family and friends or typical sofa surfers that they're commonly referred to um, but obviously we also have challenges around uh, the private sector serving notices although you'll know during the pandemic there's been an embargo on uh, private sector and local authority evictions that's been released now so we're expecting that to increase as an inevitable consequence of that policy decision um, but by and large it is around our prevention a lot of it is targeted around family media mediation trying to keep people settled and focused on that tenancy sustainment because that's the big issue for us in terms of why people come forward 
Um, so again, you know, there's a lot of detail there, and uh, you know, the report that we took to cabinet on the third of December has got all that evidence base in detail. It's an open report, so you can log on to that if you want to refresh your memory of what that was saying. Um, but again, that's some of the indicators that are important for for us. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah now, who's going to talk to you about homelessness and what it means and its definition and the changes, and then we'll pick up the um, the rough sleeping initiative and the winter relief afterwards. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Tina. Um, so I thought I'd give next slide, please. Thank you. I thought I'd start by giving a bit of a refresher and an overview to any new members, and apologies to people members that have obviously. A, fully aware of homelessness and functions, etc. Um, so this slide really introduces um, us to homelessness and how Housing Solutions is a statutory service. Uh, we are bound by the legislation alongside many other legislations that you can see in ACTS. Um, we work under mainly under the Housing Act 1996 Part 7. That was amended in 2002 um, and later on I'll come on to the Homeless Reduction Act which saw the biggest change to the Act since about 1977. As Tina rightly mentioned, um, overarching us is all the strategy from government and our own strategy um, which is entwined with our daily work and what we want to achieve here at Tamworth. Um, we've got obviously the Children's Act and we work, try and work closely with social services, adult services, um, children's services. We have to be mindful of the Equalities Act. Um, Tina's already mentioned our data returns to, that's incorrect, their apologies, but it's now DL, um, D-L-U-C-H, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> just getting used to it. Um, and then the bottom one is um, for those of you who don't know, so we work under Part 7 for homelessness, but anybody that wants to join the housing register in Tamworth, um, that's under Part 6 of the Act. So all of that application side and council housing, that all comes under Part 6. And just in the corner there, just to reiterate, we have a yearly rough sleeper figure return. Um, all local authorities have to work with Homeless Link, who um, we meet with partners, and then there's a verification process that we go through to um, return that data. Um, we look at sort of the priority need and also by, as we've already said, trying to half that rough sleeping population in line with the government strategy by 2022 um, and end it by 2025. Thank you, next slide please. So really taking it back to basics on this one um, and the next slide will go through the legal definition, but what is homelessness? So for quite for a lot of people, you may count yourself as homeless if you're staying with friends or family. You might be staying in a hostel, a night shelter or bed and breakfast. Um, you might be squatting or living in poor conditions that affect your health. Um, and a lot of people forget as well that you might be living apart from your family because you don't have a place to live together. So also that would be defined as. Really on the side, we just put about who is affected and it was just to say that a lot of people are in conjunction with the reasons for approach in the previous slides. So I used to work in London and, and down there they're described as one paycheck away um, and that's sort of the reality down there. And it can be anybody, it can be singles, it can be families, um, obviously leaving home for the first time. I think in the current climate it's very difficult for people to get on housing ladders. Um, friends or family could ask you to leave. You might be struggling to live on benefits or have a low income which creates affordability issues. And right down to splitting up with partners, um, leaving prisons or hospital discharges. You might be threatened with evictions. Um, you might be severely overcrowded or it could be. And we, do, we don't get them often, thankfully, but sometimes we do have fires or floods um, when people do have to approach us. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the legal definition under one, section 175 of the Act um, just defines it a little bit more there for you and um, that's what we're bound by as a team. So we look at if they've got, if they have no accommodation available in the UK or abroad, um, if they've got no legal right to occupy the accommodation or if the household split, they might be at risk of violence and we've just obviously had the new Domestic Abuse Act this year which has changed um, how we work quite considerably with regards to priority need, which I'll come, in, come on to shortly. 
if they're unable to secure entry to their accommodation or they might if they live in a movable structure and they've got no place to put it. And the, the picture on the right, um, just to show, we also have, we don't go to the Act regularly, we have a code of guidance that all officers adhere to and, um, and we use when we're going through our statutory duties. Um, just to come on briefly, past homelessness, um, and once we're satisfi satisfied somebody is homelessness, the first three tests really are um, if they're homeless or if they're eligible. So for new members that aren't aware, um, those that are eligible for assistance, and there is a long list, um, and it can be incredibly complex, but to keep it more simple, it's sort of British citizens, um, Irish citizens because of the common travel area, and now under the EU settlement scheme, anybody that's applied for that indefinite leave or that leave to remain. Um, and more recently as well, we've, we've had to add the Hong Kong nationals and Afghan families, which have been given indefinite leave to remain and central government sort a lot of that out. Um, and then with regards to priority need, which you'll see on the next slide, just to give a brief overview, and I'm happy to share more later. Um, it's more about, so if you're pregnant, if you've got dependent children, um, you might be homeless as a risk of, risk of domestic abuse. If you're vulnerable um, because of prison release or armed forces, um, and we get a lot of care leavers in Staffordshire, um, so that's the main reasons for priority need. Obviously, it's not as uh, simple as that, and a lot of it's covered in the legislation. Um, and everybody that approaches and when an application's taken, they all have a full assessment without going into too much detail for you. So on this slide, just to recap, um, going back to the legislation, we, prior to 2018, that was what the team worked under, and we called it five tests of homelessness. So we'd have to be satisfied if they were homeless within the 28 days, if they were eligible. We'd look at priority need, and then the last two tests would be if there was any intentionality issues, and did they have a local connection to the area, that being six out of 12 months or three out of five years. And before, we would just accept, if all of those were ticked, we would tick them and say, OK, we accept a full homelessness duty and statutory, we need to now rehouse you. So then we went, next slide, please, onto the Homeless Reduction Act. So we had a couple of amends, which seemed quite straightforward to begin with. And this act came in in 2018. Um, and for the first time, a duty was placed on the local authority and the actual applicant to try and prevent their homelessness due to um, housing and lack of housing in certain areas, um, and also to quickly relieve it regardless of whether there was any priority need. And really the main changes were that nationally there was seen to be a lot of gatekeeping where authorities might not take applications, but there wasn't also any obligation for clients to accept any help under prevention. So as somebody that worked in a larger authority prior to Tamworth, um, as an officer, I would sometimes sit and interview people where they might turn up with a bailiff's warrant and it really is that crisis on the day. So the Act was brought in to try and prevent that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Now, I'm definitely not going to talk you all through this one. <laughs> but what this does show you is that this is the new Act and this shows the level of complexity and the statutory hurdles that we now do have to follow. Um, I, I'm definitely for the Hel Homeless Reduction Act and it has been an incredible um, piece of legislation to adhere to and it really does help with that prevention of what we're trying to achieve in Tamworth. Um, our acceptances for main duty have gone down and we are relieving homelessness prior to having to accept families which either by offer of social housing or private rented sector. Um, so it has significantly changed how officers work the R, the letters R at the end of some decisions, that's that's where a decision has been made um, that's reviewable. Now, on previously, there was only two times when people could request a review, so you can see it's definitely more open and transparent. So for constituents that need to be, if you've got any queries, definitely come through because we have to follow a real strict process and we, we always have to evidence all of that, as we did before, but definitely... Um, now, thank you. Next slide, please. And really, just to summarise what we've been looking at, um, I appreciate there's lots of information there, and it's a bit of a a quick tour around that. Um, but there's lots of information to take away, and to summarise, 
the main changes. So we saw the introduction of a prevention duty and a relief duty, and both of those last 56 days. And you can't stop one. You can't start the other one without doing the 56 days in some respects. Um, it prevents the accommodation being lost, hopefully, and having that early intervention. We now have to look at doing personal housing plans with all clients. And there's also, it puts the it shares the responsibility with the client and puts the onus on them as well to look for accommodation if they need to. Um, and the relief duty, it, um, again, they get personal housing plans and then the main housing duty is owed to an applicant if they're able to go through the five tests. But with our homeless prevention grant money, we're very successful in preventing homelessness or um, definitely finding new tenancies for people whether that be social or in the private sector and they all have affordability checks um, etc the little bit at the bottom is regarding it's a little bit technical but once we're satisfied on the first three tests we look at interim accommodation through section 188 so that's where we look at if they need bed and breakfast if it's an emergency We've now moved forward with having our own council stock TA units, um, which is really good. Um, we don't have a hostel, a homeless hostel in Tamworth. So nearby, we sometimes refer them to Tamworth Cornerstone Housing Association. We've got a YMCA in Burton. Um, we do have people in Birmingham that take clients with high, sort of high needs. Um, so sometimes they're referred there. But we try and, if we can, we like to keep them in the borough immediately if we can um, and following on from that I'll take any questions before we move on if you want to yeah thank you happy we've only got a couple of slides left yeah. which just talk about the grant funding update and winter relief and then we can open it up with the chair's indulgence so in terms of next slide please sorry Joe. Um, in terms of the feedback or the progress around the rough sleeping initiative so the RSI rough sleeping initiative funding um, that we were successful in obtaining earlier on in the year. The full details of that were reported to Cabinet in July and again that report is, is on ModGov for you to have a look at. Um, but basically out of that 100,000 we, we got two sort of elements to that payment. We've received just over 61,000 so far um, and that was to fund a sort of um, sort of tr triage approach really to a mental health coordinator and worker so she's now in post and that individual works with clients, uh, with applicants, with our voluntary sector and our partners um, to help navigate individuals through a variety of care pathways to accelerate that and her contact details are on the website um, and she does you know, attempt to work with those individuals to help with life skilling etc. Um, that funding also supported an outreach officer um, and the idea behind that was to work with uh, people with complex needs to have um, tailored support plans to try and promote tenancy sustainment and help them um, into independent living and tenancies, you know, and, 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 and alternate tenancies. Um, and then the final thing was around a neighbourhood coach, which went hand in glove with up to £10,000, so a relatively modest pot, but up to £10,000 to support applicants with what we call participatory budgeting. So if people's barriers to, um, I don't know, getting a job was, you know, they need a travel warrant to get to the interview or they need to buy a new suit for the interview or they need to have a haircut or whatever, there was some small amount of sort of in-kind um, support that we could provide to help people accelerate, you know, them into successful and independent living. So that scheme, the outcomes of which uh, were reported to Cabinet, we're required to update HAS, the Harmlessness Advisory Support Team, because we were identified um, in that round of rough sleeping funding as areas of best practice. And certainly things like the mental health worker, the neighbourhood coach, the outreach worker, that triage and that approach to prevention and helping them on to longer term accommodation um, was really considered best practice. We, we were surprised at that because we think that's our bread and butter where some organisations um, and some councils who, who particularly haven't got their own stock, their own council stock, deal with the homelessness side of it but then you know leave people then to 
you know sort of expression interest in properties or come up for properties within the private sector we're lucky at Tamworth because as Sarah's alluded to not only have we got our own council housing stock but we've also got very strong links through supported housing provision and through the private sector so we try and have a um, holistic service so we don't just manage and respond to the homelessness we try and help support that people into accommodation and we do have some success with that I mean we're not going to talk about the allocations policy tonight other than to say the allocations policy was also updated at the same time as we did the homelessness strategy and we've seen the numbers fall on the housing register from two and a half thousand to around 600 of which only uh, 30 are in that sort of band one it clearly fluctuates you know as people come on and on on and off the register um, but we are able you know to, as long as people are flexible and are happy to work with us across a range of tenures and a range of options we are able to accommodate people in one way or another um, recognizing that all local councils face challenges around the supply of affordable housing um, but certainly that rough sleeping initiative and that grant funding has helped accelerate that work and support that improvement plan as part of our homelessness and rough sleeping strategy um, so there's about what 39,000 38,000 left to come from the government um, in, in just after Christmas and that we are you know we're seeking your views on that because it could certainly be something that we pick up with the portfolio holder and with with cabinet um, but at the moment the the proposals in the grant application which were agreed by government were for a begging initiative because as we talked about earlier sometimes there is a perception that people are rough sleeping when in fact they're out they are actually begging and these initiatives they're again they're nothing new I think you might have seen um, a, a news release from Dudley not long ago where you know they're coming up with these partner-led schemes where instead of having a financial investment for people to give a beggar the cash you know then they're through a tap and collect service or through um, you know crowdfunding pages that money goes into our charitable and partner organizations to support the prevention of rough sleeping and eliminates to some extent the financial incentive for people to come on the train beg here for a day and then go home um, so there, we will be looking at those begging initiatives later on in the uh, financial year and again happy to take any sort of feedback around that um, which brings me nicely if we want to go to the sort of next slide please Joe, on the severe weather emergency protocols or SHWEP as if we can go to the next one sorry we did take that one out sorry Joe. next one please yeah the last one um, this is referred to as SHWEP or the severe weather emergency protocol and it covers our winter relief arrangements that as I said at the beginning typically typically run from the beginning of December till the end of February although we have known depending on the adverse um, you know nature of the weather to extend it beyond February sometimes but typically it's over that three month window and it's the government's requirement on local authorities to put arrangements in place um, to support people who are at risk of uh, homelessness but where there is inclement weather so the idea being it's uh, no second night out yeah. um, that where the weather falls below freezing or zero degrees then irrespective of people's priority need they should be temporarily accommodated um, so what we've done historically is work and collaborate with our voluntary sector and our partners and again you know I'm really proud of the work that you know Starfish, Heart of Tamworth and you know everybody always says to me we could probably read out a load of names who contribute to to that work but the work that we do with our partners allows us to provide that peripatetic support in the community around um, facilitation and navigation of things like food banks food parcels we've run shelters in the past in conjunction with the church all of which have been able to uh, help again focus on supporting that individual uh, into you know more more permanent and settled accommodation so this year the proposal um, is that we run that winter relief project again um, it's on the forward plan already for the 11th of November we wanted to share with you the proposals likely to be going to cabinet tonight so as a scrutiny committee if you want to make any observations or comments we can make sure they're captured in the report um, but basically the 
proposals are that we continue to work with the heart of Tamworth. There is a financial, small financial investment in that. Um, and that basically provides that continued wraparound support. So it's not accommodation based, um, you know, because we recognise that to some extent, if you have a hostel type situation, then you build it and they come. So it's more around providing that pastoral care and support and helping people into more settled and longer term solutions. And there's a whole list of things there that that support covers um, in terms of surgeries at uh, the manor house and at the churches to help people um, in terms of what their onward accommodation aspirations are and help complete all the housing application forms it provides single points of contact it links in with what we've talked about earlier with the mental health outreach and neighborhood coach so that they can provide um, that sort of life skilling as well as um, and it really you know i can't underestimate how much those voluntary organizations they really are our anchor organizations in providing that intelligence because i think what they do which we as a council can't is provide that level of independence and support sometimes people will go to a voluntary organization because they feel more comfortable than coming to what is a institution if you like in terms of you know explaining that so sometimes that level of ag advocacy is really invaluable so the cabinet report in november is obviously to be drafted and we will be making those uh, proposals um, but yes yeah, so that's it i think chair from our point of view so happy to open it up for debate and questions thank you very much Thank you, Tina and Sarah. Absolutely, yeah. And thank you for the refresher and for you know for the new members to understand how how things work. Um, the one thing that I want to pick up on um, is it's great to hear that we're emphasising on prevention because it seems to me that that is probably a key to a lot of things. Um, yeah, and you picked up on the the three things that we've specifically asked you to to bring forward for us um i'll open it up to committee now if anybody has any questions councillor harper hello thanks team that was a fabulous uh, uh presentation thanks very much and it's very enlightening it's something i think that a lot of us don't give too much thought about uh, unfortunate people who end up on the streets. What I'd like to know though, um, right at the very start of the process, how do we identify uh, rough sleepers? I, I know I can obviously, we've all seen them, I mean I've seen them in the in Milo's Corner in uh, the Castle Grounds which is a popular venue. Uh, we've seen them in Middle Entry and various other places around the town. But how are you notified about them being in the town is it police is it calls from the public or do they come to us or what what how, how do you know about them i'm happy to start that but then sarah might need to to come in on that so um we get notifications through street link um in terms of if members of the public they can report in that if they've seen people who they perceive to be rough sleeping so that's you know a daily alert that we get if that's observed and, and people want to report that in but in addition to that, um, you know, our CCTV service monitors for us and lets us know. Our homelessness officers do regular street sweeps um, with the community wardens. Um, and generally, we get notified through all sorts of social media activity as well, you know, through Facebook and Twitter. So there's a whole plethora of mechanisms when that information comes to us, both informally and formally. Um, but certainly the team are all out on the patch at least once a week. I mean, we walk up through middle entry regularly because that seems to be one of the areas where there seems to be a congregation of people who appear to be rough sleeping. Sarah and I walked round um, last week and there was a sleeping bag there, but nobody in it. Um, and we couldn't see any other evidence of, of anybody else rough sleeping. But we regularly ask the community wardens and the PCSOs from the police to to check on that for us um, but as I say when we do encounter somebody who is rough sleeping we ask for the names and details and then we do do partner verification um, but often 
we find that they're either known to us and have not engaged in the past. Um, there was a particular individual who used to beg outside Aldi uh, in the town, was well known to us but wouldn't engage even though they'd been offered accommodation um, or they are begging, in which case then we ask the police to look at community protection warnings and notices to move people on in terms of that sanction. Um, so again I am proud of Tamworth's position because yes there might be people there but there's not many who that we don't already know about or aren't attempting to make contact with you know which obviously contrasts with some of our partner organisations um, you know and you've all seen the, the news around sort of Birmingham and the issues they face you know we don't have that entrenched rough sleeping we have transient at best um, and begging you know at worst so and there are prevention activities for that so anything else you want and, to and yourselves we get e counsellors emailing in which is always helpful because the members of the community um which they notify us the police notify us and the outreach officer um now goes out and just like what tina said um the one that we saw this week that we know was out we're, we're very aware of them and we know the individual's um, circumstances and whether you know he might have a tenancy, but at the moment we've accommodated him. So every one of them, I could sit with you privately and tell you all their names. And but that is through collaborative working with partners, Heart of Tamworth Police, and and just the general community. It's really refreshing actually working where I've worked in the past, where you know people were allowed to rough sleep continuously. Here we do absolutely try and work with them and definitely offer them accommodation and. I don't like to think of anybody being out um, because, you know, anything could happen to them. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. I may just add a, yes, uh, a yeah. secondary. Um, it's, that's very interesting what you say. So uh, from what I'm, I'm hearing from you is you actually know most of these people, uh, that they are known to you. Because I'm sure you're aware there's a perception in the town that we, are, we do get a lot of professional beggars who just... Uh, con people into giving them money and then go off to their homes or wherever um, but you get to know these people you get to know their backgrounds and um, presumably I don't know do you know what happens if you do get these people are they dealt with properly uh, Council Arthur absolutely I mean we do stop and challenge we have those conversations we are quite tenacious in terms of doing that um, and where we can, you know, where there is a, a homelessness issue, we do try and provide onward support arrangements. If it becomes a community safety risk because they won't engage and they are begging, then we tackle that in, you know, a number of ways, but two in particular. One is we work with the police colleagues on our community safety agenda to try and look at the most reasonable and proportionate sanction to tackle that which, as I've said, one of the options is sometimes community protection warnings or notices or fixed penalty arrangements or even looking at injunctive relief we've used in the past. We do, you know, use the, the best tool in the toolbox to deter that. Um, but then the other mechanism for tackling that is through that prevention approach. So, as I mentioned earlier, the grant funding that we've been successful in, looking at a begging initiative, again, in collaboration with our... Um, our police partners around and our voluntary sector partners around how we can deter the financial incentive because if nobody gives them any money they won't come they'll go elsewhere so I think it's about you know really getting that off the ground and we'll be keen to do that because I think if we can stop it at source certainly from the benchmarking we've done with with other authorities they've seen a 90% drop in that once that financial uh, imperative is removed I mean, of course, it relies on the community then not giving them the money. Um, but I think people, consciences, moral compass, if they can, you know, tap something that allows it to go to a local charity or a partner or a crowdfunding page, you know, that helps. So we'll do our best to uh, to manage that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Farrell, did you just want to... Come in there. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up with Councillor Harper. It's a really good point, you know, and perception is important because we see, you know, I see people and you don't you don't know initially where they come from. Um, you do have professional beggars, as, as Tina and Sarah have said, that, you know, drive over to Tamworth, let's say, and park for the day, 
then make their money and then go back to their house in wherever they come from. Um, and it's really important when members contact us and say, we've, we've seen someone homeless, you know, what do we do about that? Um, but we had an incident uh, about a month ago where a councillor contacted me and said, it was the it was the gentleman at Aldi actually and said Th- this um, this guy's you know homeless and but then the councillor engaged with the person and the person told the councillor lies and said this is my problem and then we went to the effort of, of getting them some accommodation that night which they didn't turn up to so that that is the issue um, and I think you know Sarah and the team are really uh, good with that sort of thing they know who who is who generally but it is difficult and perception is more difficult because. You know, sometimes the public can say, well, I see people down middle entry, but, you know, as we know, they aren't homeless. But it's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, can I just add to that? Because I think the other the other element to that in terms of um, that homelessness is other authorities do place on our in our town. So, you know, we have got links with Birmingham because they place people um, opposite the Castle Hotel at the Brew House. They are withdrawing from that, they tell us. Um, but there have been a couple of constituent inquiries um, from Birmingham's own clients where they've accepted the duty, but those people have been to our own councillors to say, we're in Tamworth, actually, what are you doing for us? But actually, they're, they're not, they're, 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 the duty is not owed by us. Birmingham have accepted them as, as their case. Um, and actually, we're doing everything to work with Birmingham because they have got different sets of challenges to us. Um, but that's also something to be mindful of. There could be people sometimes who are homeless in Tamworth, but who the borough council has not got a responsibility for. It's held by either a neighbouring authority, um, which is one of our partner districts, or by Birmingham. Um, and we are, there are elements in the legislation where we are asked for assistance sometimes, and we do have to provide that. So it's just to be aware of that as well. Thank you. And can I just say one, just to add to that, thank you as well, just to not do them a complete disservice sometimes, we are dealing with um, clients that have got multiple complex issues and um, it's not always straightforward and sometimes that perception of them, um, we know I've got one that sits out because he doesn't want to sit in his flat, Um, so there is unfortunately with substance misuse and different things like that we are dealing with quite a chaotic cohort um, and it's not just Tamworth you know this nationally they're everywhere so we have to be very mindful of that and how we deal with them and sometimes they might not be thinking straight and so a lot goes into it so thank you sorry thank you yes there seems to be a lot of complexities um, in homelessness isn't there um council people yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it was just really to add to um, the response to Councillor Harper that there's lots of different ways that people are identified, but one of them is that those of us who've been involved with the various third sector organisations that have supported the winter night shelters in the past, um, some people are sort of known around town and we get phoned up. Um, quite often we get, myself and Simon get phoned up, um, we've seen X, we've seen Y, we think they might be homeless, what do we do? Um, and then, of course, we refer them to Sarah and her team who do a brilliant job, brilliant job, um, in in helping to provide that support. Um, but I would also reiterate what Sarah said, that there's a fine balance, really. Um, it's very easy to assume that anybody that you see with their hand out is a professional beggar, and they're not. There's a mixture of people. There are some people who are unfortunately um, professional beggars, but there are also some people who are genuinely down on their luck and uh, really do need the help and support. And finally, Chair, thank you. The the point that Sarah made about complex needs, that's what we've seen to a, to a huge degree. Um, we've got a very low number of street homeless in Tamworth, but the people who end up street homeless tend to be people with particularly complex needs and they are very difficult to support because um, you, you, you sort of you work quite hard with them to get them to a, a place where they're settled and they're comfortable and then some life um, event happens and they're back to square one so we've got a small number of people with really complex needs um, but I think the council's doing uh, you know uh, my experience of the team is that they're doing a great job to address those needs on a an individual basis. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor People. Any more questions, comments? 
Well, as this actually was a presentation, we don't have any specific recommendations, but would the committee like to consider anything that we want to recommend to Cabinet? No? Councillor Farrell. Oh, I was going to sum up, but if Councillor Harper wants to say something. Councillor Thank Harper. you, Chair. All I basically wanted is to just, uh, do, I suspect exactly what Alex is about <laughs> to do, uh, is just to say you're doing a fantastic job. I know it's uh, terribly difficult to sort out the, um, the true um, people who are suffering and the, r the real victims because... Um, we all we all loathe the fact that some people will misuse uh, or try to gain victim status to uh, further their own particular uh, needs. And um, well done, well done for doing that and um, for looking after these terribly vulnerable people. And um, congratulations on, on what you're doing, and please keep up the good work. Thank Councillor you, Farrell. Thank you, Chair. No, I just wanted to echo the comments, you know, and uh, I think Councillor People summed it up by saying they're doing a brilliant job, and, and you really are. Um, you know, we're very lucky that uh, this year we've got this portfolio which includes homelessness prevention, and, you know, it's really important. You know, the team are doing a great job. I'm really proud of what they're doing, you know, behind the scenes. There's lots going on. Um, you know, this £100,000 award we've had um, from the Rough Sleep Sleeping Initiative has, yeah, has really helped um, and is fantastic, but, you know, it's the work the team do, you know, the prevention, um, keeping these numbers in single figures you know their target for 2021 a rough sleeping count of, of zero you know that there's testament to the team how hard they're working led by Tina and Sarah um, you know and I think they're doing some really good work so thank you for, for listening to us okay thank you thank you very much I know from personal experience of speaking to people at, um, at housing with Sarah that you know you do do a fantastic job and um, you know you can only be sort of congratulated for that and to keep going and let's hope this winter isn't as bad as um, last winter <laughs> um, so thank you both for coming and thank you Alex thank you very much if you don't mind chair I'll, I'll disappear Tina and Sarah you're quite welcome to stay if you want to but if you yeah, okay. Okay, we'll now move on to agenda item number nine, safeguarding children and adults at risk of abuse report. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Councillor Stephen Doyle, who's a portfolio holder for regulatory and community safety. And we also have Steph Ivey, partnership vulnerability officer. Um, the report circulated provides the first of two biannual safeguarding updates to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. This report provides an overview of the safeguarding processes and procedures in place to discharge the Council's legal duty to safeguard children and adults with care and support needs from abuse and neglect. I'll just hand over to Councillor Doyle now to introduce the presentation. Thank you, you've took the words out of me mouth. <laughs> so I think the there's little else for me to do but to introduce Stephanie. Uh, many of you wouldn't have met Stephanie Ivy. She's been doing this role for a number of years uh, because you're relatively new to the council. Um, unfortunately, she's moving on to another uh, role in a week's time, which I'll miss because we've worked together more or less since I joined Cabinet about 10 years back. So it's been a long time working together. But I shall leave Stephanie to... 
Thank you. The report. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Good evening, councillors. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the work that's been taking place since last I came to committee on the 21st of April this year. Um, it is a brief overview and I will just will echo what Councillor Claymore said at the beginning. If there's anything within the report that you want to speak to me afterwards or anything that you're unsure of, please, I will hang around. You can come and speak to me after after I deliver the, um, the session. So I always start off with safeguarding statistics to let you know how many referrals we have had through our safeguarding process um, as a borough council. So the number of safeguarding concerns that have been referred via the Council's report and procedure for the date period from the 1st of April until the 30th of September are as follows. Quarter 1, in relation to children, we had three referrals. We've seen an increase in quarter 2 to 9, so quite, quite a substantial increase in quarter 2. In relation to adult referrals, in quarter 1 we had five adult referrals and in quarter two we had ten. So again we had a much busier quarter quarter two than we had quarter one in relation to those referrals coming through. Those referrals continue to come through from a vast array of colleagues within the council, be that council members, be that customer service officers, housing solutions officers, our tenancy sustainment officers, and also our sheltered housing managers. So really those frontline people that are out meeting the public, they tend to be the referrers through, through our process of concerns around safeguarding. In relation to the reasons why the safeguarding referrals are coming through, we tend to see a trend with, with those, and we've tended to see that trend year on year in regards to the categories um, of, of abuse that comes through. In relation to children, the main category that we see for, for abuse is neglect, and, and that's reflective across, across the UK. Neglect is the biggest category of abuse that our children are experiencing in the UK. And in relation to adults, we see quite a number of concerns raised by staff around individuals who are self-harming or who are threatening to take their own lives. Um, we see quite a number of those referrals um, per month in relation to in relation to that. So individuals who are struggling. Um, we also tend to see quite a number of referrals around self-neglect, so people not looking after themselves. And they tend to come from our housing officers who've maybe gone out to visit a home and have got concerns about somebody who's not looking after themselves, not looking after them home environment. And we do have concerns about their welfare and well-being. So those are the are the statistics for um for the first six months of this of this year from April to September. In relation to I've put an update in relation to um the Staffordshire Safeguarding Children's Board. I think at the past two um committee meetings that have come to. Um, I've told you that we haven't yet completed our section 11 audit for the Staffordshire Safeguarding Children Board. I'm pleased to say we now have completed it. Um, the pandemic put us back quite a bit but we had the audit through from the Safeguarding Children's Board and they focused on one key element for the audit um, for this year and that was around um, learning and development. So they wanted to know how we were training our staff um, how we were imparting knowledge to them around um, abuse of children and especially around their priority areas as well um, for, for the board. Um, one of the priority areas for the board is um, around criminal exploitation of children as well as neglect of children. So they very much wanted to know what we were doing with our staff around training them to recognise those issues. Um, and, and give them confidence in reporting those issues going forward. In relation to the Safeguarding Adults Board, again, we completed an audit for the Safeguarding Adults Board. It was a full audit, um, and we have sent that back to, to, to the board. Um, we have no statutory requirement to, to um, complete that um, audit. However, it is good practice to do that, and I think it is really good practice for us as an organisation to understand how we are measuring up against those standards that they are setting for us um, in relation to safeguarding adults. So that has been completed as well. We will await to see whether there's any recommendations from those audits from both boards, and we will update at the next committee meeting if we do have recommendations in relation to those. 
In relation to our safeguarding training, we continue to deliver our safeguarding training via two e-learning modules um, for staff. Uh, and we have a children's module and we have a safeguarding adults module. I think one of the one of the positives from the pandemic um, around training has been the ability for us to very quickly be able to pull together a training presentation on Microsoft Teams for any teams within the council that feel they need a little bit of added information in regards to safeguarding children or adults. So what I would say to managers is if your teams have completed the e-learning training and they want any more additional training, there's anything they don't understand, I can go on and speak to the team around any concerns that they have or around any issues that they don't understand. So that's been a real positive, being able to, um, to be able to deliver training via Microsoft Teams at short notice to different, um, to different teams. Um, I was really pleased with the attendance at the uh, Microsoft Teams safeguarding session we done for members on the 10th of June. It was it was well attended by new members uh, as well, so I, I, I was pleased with with that. I just wanted to put in a little uh, a little um, information about the suicide prevention training. As I said at the beginning, we have seen an increase in the number of referrals we're getting for people who are threatening to take their own lives or self or self harm. And the suicide prevention training has really been beneficial to staff around how to deal with those conversations um, with somebody who may be threatening to take their own their own life. Um, how to recognise the signs, how to, ha how to have that open and honest conversation with them around the concerns that you have, and most importantly, how do we get support to that, to that individual to help them through that, that period in their life or that moment of, of crisis. Um, we have had over 40 members now attend, or sorry, 40 of our staff um, complete that um, training which is delivered by Staffordshire Mind and again it's delivered on Microsoft Teams by two mental health professionals. Um, members are more than welcome to attend that session and I'm more than happy to share on the members zone the details of that training. I've attended the training, I found it really useful and it has helped me in some difficult conversations that I've had to have with people who have been threatening to take their own lives. It has really given me the confidence to have that open and honest conversation with them. So I would recommend if you get the chance, it's a half day training session, I think it would be really helpful and I'll put the, the details on the members on the members zone. Keeping on the theme of training, taxi driver training, um, the partnership officer who I work very closely with has recommenced delivery of safeguarding training for our taxi drivers. As you can imagine, our taxi drivers are dealing with some of our most vulnerable people as well, taking them to hospital appointments, maybe picking people up um, from nightclubs, picking vulnerable people up, sometimes um, taking children to and from school. So it's really important that our taxi drivers understand what safeguarding is and most importantly what to do if they have a concern about a child or an adult at risk and they believe they may be at risk of harm or abuse and how to pass that information on. So 57 drivers required refresher training and of those 57, 37 have now completed that and we've had 11 new drivers who will complete the initial safeguarding training as well. So I just wanted to let um, the committee know that the training has begun again for our taxi drivers. In relation to sort of ongoing work that I get involved in in, in, a, in a daily basis, um, I just wanted to give members a bit of an update on the multi-agency child exploitation panel. I think at last committee meeting we talked quite in depth about contextual safeguarding, safeguarding children from criminal exploitation, from sexual exploitation. It's a real concern, not just in Tamworth, but across the whole of the UK, and I'm sure you've seen it on the news around county lines and around young people getting drawn into criminal exploitation. So it's something that we, we're really passionate about, and we're really passionate about raising awareness about exploitation of young people within our community. We had a meeting with um, the Police Child Exploitation Early Intervention and Prevention Worker just last week, 
and she is very keen to work with us around an awareness campaign um, within Tamworth to raise awareness with the wider community of the signs of children who may be potentially involved in child criminal exploitation and also with local businesses as well. So that's a piece of work that we will continue to develop going forward because I think it's really important that the community can spot the signs of young people who may be at risk of being exploited and ensure that we're passing that information on to the relevant agencies to deal with it and get support for those young people. In relation to our locality partnership meeting, um, I attend the locality partnership meeting. Um, it's both represented as from our statutory organisations, but also our community and voluntary organisation. It provides a real great opportunity for people delivering early help services in Tamworth for children and families to come and talk about what they deliver what they can do for families to support them going forward and how we can refer into those services. I attend that meeting and then we will cascade that information down to our frontline service workers, be it housing or be it our community wardens, around those early help services that are out there to support children and families because we know prevention we've talked about it earlier with 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 housing prevention is, is is key and the earliest we can identify an unmet need with the child within a family and get support and help to them the better the outcome is going to be for that child and family so what it's really important that early help agenda is really important and it's something that, that, that we um we work really hard with partner agencies and um, to understand what is out there and um, delivered by community groups to support to support our vulnerable people in the community and that also goes we t tend to talk about early help agenda for children but again with vulnerable adults as well or adults at risk the sooner we can identify a concern with for somebody the sooner we can get a service to support them the better the outcome is going to be for that person last committee meeting I did talk a bit about modern slavery as well I think the committee asked for an update at our last committee meeting um, chair around modern slavery uh, and our approach to modern slavery and we do work very close with our partners uh, in relation to this um, police fire service social services adult social care mental health teams it really is a partnership approach um, for safeguarding nobody we one organization or agency can't do it on their own it's when we all join up together we're more effective um, to, to, to respond to to the needs of, of our vulnerable people we have been to the um, tactical meeting that's coordinated by Staffordshire police um, this multi-agency meeting it identifies emerging trends hotspot areas it's also a really great meeting to be involved in because we have experts from all walks of life and all professions sitting around that table who are experts in their field so it's really good to go to that to get their knowledge on what they're saying and how we can work with them going going forward um, unfortunately um, the numbers for human trafficking is is quite staggering um, we believe there's 40 million people worldwide who are potentially um, caught in modern slavery and there were 10,000 potential victims identified by authorities in the UK in 2019. It still very much is a hidden crime and again it's about raising awareness within communities of what to look out for, what are the signs and how to report those signs to the authorities to try to get support and help for, for people that are experiencing it. I always like to finish off with my Tamworth Vulnerability Partnership update. We continue to work really well with our partners here in Tamworth, with our police, our mental health teams, our fire service, adult social care, children's social care. We have a really good network and partnership working with all those agencies. It provides a joined up response to vulnerability within the community where we have identified somebody that is vulnerable in the community. Again, what support and help can we get to that child, that family, that vulnerable adult to help them? 
Um, we have reviewed the terms of reference. I think at the last um, committee meeting, Chair, I said we were in the process of doing that. We have reviewed the terms of reference. And we've also widened the scope slightly of that um, Tamworth Vulnerability Partnership meeting to now incorporate um, community safety um, in relation to young people involved in antisocial behaviour within the community. We really need to understand what we're seeing within the community with young people around antisocial behaviour because it does very much link in. If we can if we can identify those young people who are involved in antisocial behaviour at an earliest opportunity and get preventative services to work with them, we hope that will stop those children from having that trajectory of going into criminal exploitation and being exploited going forward so we work we, we, we are going to use the, I think this is our third meeting now that we, we, we have incorporated antisocial behavior and young people but we're hoping that really will be preventative and and really stop some of those young people getting drawn into that criminal exploitation going forward and chair that finishes my my report to committee Thank you. Thank you, Steph, for that. I've got another couple of comments to make, if I can, please, before I, I open it up. Um, the suicide prevention training, is that something that we... Well, you did say you could put it on for the members, but is it something that we ought to be considering, you know, doing it perhaps every six months or something like that? I, I, do, I don't think every six... W with our safeguarding training, we refresh our safeguarding training every every three years. Right. I think the suicide training, Councillor Claymore, I would say if that was it, maybe every two two years, it may be, be worth um, doing. It's quite an in-depth course. It's a, it's a half a day. Um, I think it just equips you with the tools around those difficult conversations. I think what it did for me was... If you're expecting the conversation, when you've been on the training, if the conversation arises, you're sort of prepared for it. And I think you're prepared to be able to ask the difficult qu questions of somebody when they say that they, they, they're feeling suicidal or they're threatening to take their own life. It really gave me the confidence to have that conversation with that person and explore w where they were, really to understand what support does that person need at that moment in time? You know, it, are they in real crisis, or is it that we can actually give them the telephone number of the Samaritans and say there are support services out there? So I think the training I find it really, really beneficial. It's a half day, but I think maybe every two years rather than every six months. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. I mean, I've certainly had emails um, from constituents that you know does mention suicide um, and you're never really quite sure what to do with it but obviously it would be referred to yourselves but there is always the possibility that somebody might even stop you in the street or when you're out and about and, and mention these things so Just that's something that I think members I think members would be find very useful just in your own personal life as well. I don't think there's many people that haven't been affected by the topic, you know, either mm -hmm. relatives, friends, extended family, you know, it, it, it really is. And, and we know it's the biggest killer of, of men over, over you know, a, a, within a certain age bracket. So mm -hmm. I think the more we talk about it, and the Staffordshire County Council's campaign is around talk suicide, we have to talk about it, you know, because that's, that and, and get away from that stigma associated with it. And I think this training, I, 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 I can't um, sort of um, promote it enough for you. I think it, it would be very useful for, you, for people to have that conversation with somebody that is struggling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the particular items we have on this committee at the moment is mental wellbeing. And I certainly think that would fit in very tidily with that. And the other one I wanted just to mention was the um, the county lines and you know young people vulnerability. Um, you did mention that you were going to try and formalise a campaign, an awareness campaign. Yeah, we're going to work. There was a recent campaign that Staffordshire Police just ran last week um, in relation to county lines across Staffordshire. We're we are working with the um, prevention team um, from the police. Um, and we would like to run something local here in Tamworth 
to raise with the, within the community through community groups as well um, and also with local businesses because sometimes it's local businesses that may see children hanging about you know at, at late late at night or outside premises or see suspicious activity and I always think if you don't know about it you'll never see it so I think it is about raising that awareness. So that's a piece of work that we're looking at going forward. This group, uh, th this lady that we met from, from Staffordshire Police, they're taking best practice from across the UK, from, from other districts, um, or sorry, from other um, local authority areas, bringing that together. And then we will look at how that's going to look in Tamworth. But we, we would certainly like to run a campaign in Tamworth with local businesses, with the community, to raise awareness around child um, child criminal exploitation and child sexual exploitation. That's really, really good to hear. And just to say, you know, well done on completing the Section 11. <laughs> At last. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'll open it to any questions or comments. Councillor Brinlow. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Steph. Fantastic uh, presentation, as always. Um, again, just following on from um, what Rosie just said with regards to the suicide prevention uh, training. How is that much different to the mental health first aid training? Because I know I mentioned that, I think it was in the second coming together of this committee that I've, I've undertaken that uh, training and I think that's something that would be really useful to counsellors. So as well as suicide prevention training, the wider mental health first aid training I think would be really useful to members and I would urge to try and include that in, in member training moving forward. I'd certainly take that back, Councillor Brindley, um, and and say I I have completed the um, the mental health um, trainer tra a number of years ago. The suicide training, quite similar, covers the same sort of topics, but not so much in depth because I'm sure that mental health um, training was the the training course that I did. I think was over two days, and um, so it was quite an in depth course. Um, but yeah, I can certainly bring that back and uh, and speak uh, and speak to um, my assistant director in regards to it. But I think anything that upskills us with knowledge and confidence to deal with some of these issues is is, is only a good thing, definitely. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, and I think it's definitely that evolution of, of upskilling sort of uh, members, and certainly something that's so prevalent and so important today as an issue. Uh, I think it makes our training very relevant and very useful to everybody. Thank you. And, and I will put, if I can just say, Chair, I, I will put the link to the sort of Talk Suicide website um, that's on the uh, on the Staffordshire County Council's website because there's a lot of good resources there as well um, around where you can signpost people to who may be struggling too to get that additional support and help. But it, it's definitely a top a topic that that I'm very passionate about, and I think the more we talk about it, the the, the stigma reduces. Uh, Councillor Wyatt. Good evening, Steph. Good On the first one we attended, of mental health, we we put a, a, a proposal forward that we'd have um, posters made. Okay. And I get them in the buzz, buzzes and the taxis and stuff. But we've not even heard anything back about it. Was I'm that was that in? I'm wondering was that a was that a scrutiny committee meeting that you had along with the mental health team? I'm I'm trying to. I can't remember having that conversation when I delivered. So I'm wondering did. I think well, this is what came out from the MFPT, wasn't it? That you know we'd put that forward. Um, when you were at the last meeting, no, I was on the first meeting. Yeah. That one, but the second one I yeah. didn't make it. Obviously, I had COVID. I think we reiterated and pushed very hard that communication of any type is got to be the way forward for signposting people to. The different agencies that can help them with those types of things and they took that away and we're hoping at some point they'll come back with something on that because didn't I, I don't know if he was there but didn't, didn't they, they did mention that they got funding for it didn't they yeah they got funding so if they've got funding i don't understand why they ain't got it out and got it into our communities with these posters because when you've got people sitting at home behind the computer who have health problems 
they ain't gonna get onto the Tamworth web page and, and all they need to see it clearly and this is what I, I don't understand nothing's come back getting it into the heart of our communities and getting it out there and it's I don't know when it was when we first had it but it's been a few months then a few months I think we could have got it out there and uh, and got it recognised more within them few months instead of being there now and just saying where's the, where's the posters and stuff I think it's, it's, it's it isn't relevant really for you, Steph. It, it, it's more from um, the MFPT. And we did have um, big discussions about communications and they did take that on board. So let's hope that, you know, in the next couple of months that we do see something coming forward. But I don't think that's oh. for, for Steph at the moment. Oh. I do apologise. I think I got it all mixed up. Any, I thought it was all no, as one. No, that's absolutely like, fine. No, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. I mean, I thought the these way. was like a part of what we got took part in the first lot. So I do apologise. No, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> Councillor People. Chair, thanks very much. I think Councillor Wade makes a good point, and perhaps mm. we could follow that up with our colleagues who we saw at the last meeting. Mm. Um, obviously, it's not something for Steph, but. Uh, we should perhaps chase it up. Sure, I, I am happy to take that back to, um, to I think it was the partnership team that came along with the mental health team that night, um, maybe to deliver um, something. I'm, I'm, happy, I, I'm happy to go back and ask a question. Thank you for that, thank you. Have we any more questions, comments? Councillor People. Yeah, thanks very much, Steph, as ever. Um, and uh, thank you for all you've done in this area for all these years. And I, uh, I do wish you all the best in your new role, whatever that may be. Um, I wondered whether you've seen, and I suppose this is a question for both of you, whether you've seen any trends that you think may have been related to the pandemic in terms of safeguarding issues. I was interested to see that the figures had been lower in quarter one than quarter two, but whether there's any significance in that, I don't know. But I wondered what, what impact, if any, you think the pandemic might have had. I think it definitely has had an impact. I think it's probably had more of an impact for those vulnerable families who, um, when, when we were in proper lockdown, were, were, were services couldn't maybe go in and support within family homes. I think that definitely had an, an, an effect. I think it would also have an effect for those children where school is a safe haven for them. Um, not being able to attend school because so much safeguarding work happens within the school setting as well to support those children and families. Um, in relation to the figures um, for this quarter, um, I, we, we had quite a big increase in relation to child referrals from three till nine and quarter two. We, we, and it was, it was interesting to listen to my housing colleagues and I work very closely with Housing Solutions because a lot of those vulnerable people that they are coming across will naturally come to me as well um, because of the safeguarding concerns around them. But we did have a, a number of young people who were um, parental evictions, you know, 17 years of age, breakdown in family life. So we've seen quite a number of those referrals in quarter two were actually for young people around about 17, nearly 18, whose parents were evicting them from their property. And Sarah and Tina's team do a great job because they do that mediation with those families to try to keep those children, you know, within that home setting or they work with social services to find a safe place for them to be um, with, within the community, be that with a cornerstone with supported housing. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think the pandemic has had, has, has had an impact um, on, on children and on vulnerable adults as well. That isolation um, we, we, and, and on those figures for self-harm, feeling suicidal, I do believe that it contributes to to, to those figures and um, the way um, we, we were living in, in those periods of time, especially in lockdown where people did become isolated and felt isolated. But I would also say, councillor people, um, like uh, 
Sarah and Tina said, I'm very proud of the community and voluntary groups in Tamworth because they do a stupendous um, amount for our vulnerable children and our vulnerable adults to support them through food banks, through pastoral support. Um, th there's a lot of really good work goes on with, within our community. I think we are very, very lucky the support that we have from our community and voluntary sector partners with it within Tamworth. Thank you. Councillor Greitrex. Thank you, Jo. Um, thankfully, I've got uh, children who I bend their ears about <laughs> problems and they have to listen whether they want to or not. But I wanted to just mention something about this, for me, fairly modern concept of, um, of uh, slavery. Um, what's the general area that these poor people are sort of inveigled into working? Um, I mean, how, are, how many are there? How many cases have we had? And what sort of areas are they are they working in? Well, we, we work very close with 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 our colleagues uh, in police and and social services and and wherever. But modern slavery covers a raft of different situations, and um, be it human trafficking, domestic service, food, forced labour, um, including sexual exploitation. So there are there are a number of areas, and 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 sometimes they intertwine as well quite quite complex. What I would say, Councillor Greatrix, is it very much remains a hidden a hidden crime, you know, it really does. And I think unless you know, and that's where training is really important, and we do have a modern slavery e-learning training package um, in the council. I think if if you don't understand it or, or you don't recognise what the signs and indicators of it are, you may never see it. So um, it, it's usually forced labour, maybe around car washes, nail bars, brothels, all those sorts of things where people are um, people are forced into labour for other people to exploit them for monetary purposes. You know, for monetary purposes. Um, so it covers a raft of and and. It's, it's not a new thing, modern slavery. Slavery's been going on for such a long time, you know, so it's not a new thing. But I'm more than happy, um, Chair, if, 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 if you would find it useful for, for maybe to, to deliver some sort of modern slavery training for, for councillors to, to, to look at that. We do have the e-learning package, but if it was something committee would like at one of these meetings, more than happy for for the organise that if you'd like more detail on it and maybe see if we can get somebody from from the police um to come along and, and do a little bit of a talk around it and around what 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 we are seeing that's a very very nice offer uh, yeah come out, sure. are there many convictions in, in tamworth regarding what yes we we have had yes we have and we've worked with the police over a number of i was going to give you an example councillor door no go on ahead um, I'll be honest, Steph's covered just about everything that I was going to say. Slavery's always been there in one form or, a th uh, or another. It's just the context that's changed. Uh, previously, somebody was designated as somebody's chattel and would be treated as so. These days, they use financial uh, measures or whatever to p place these people in what they perceive as debt and they have to work it off by one means or another. So it's always been there one way or another. The thing is now is that the it's more widely recognised. There are more efforts now to outlaw it and prevent it from happening. And it does happen in in our society. And it's happened uh, less than 100 yards from the council building. Um, there was a certain restaurant that had uh, was bringing in uh, people from abroad uh, putting them up and expecting them to work in the restaurant. Uh, the police actually, uh, funny enough, actually walked past it the day that they raided the place. Um, but the police um, were giving in information about it and uh, it was tackled and dealt with. It's quite common throughout yeah. the whole of the UK. I mean, it really is. When, when you look at those figures that I said, you know, 10,000 potential victims identified by authorities in the UK in 2019. 10,000. And 
and that's and I'm telling you that it's a hidden crime but we've managed to identify 10,000 so what is the true what are the true figures you know so yeah but more than happy councillor great tricks to get some more information to to committee around that if that's a subject area you would like more information on yes thank you for that maybe that's something we can put on for uh, one of the future meetings so thank you for that offer councillor way did you want to speak again yeah yeah i mean just just a quick one on slavery i see it every day on construction sites i don't i, I don't have to talk about it we see it every day so i can put what well, our wages get compressed why well, i have to go to london to earn a wage i see it every day but that's for them to deal with another about uh, antisocial behavior i don't know if the other councillors but where i live in glasgow i can see why we have antisocial behavior because there's nothing for them to do and I think it's we got to put more as a councillor. I want to put more emphasis on the on on, on on the council to make facilities for the children to go and do them. Because if they're just hanging around on street corners, they're going to smash people's windows. Because it's I dare you do that. I dare you do that. And that's where it just escalates, escalates, escalates from. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, I totally agree with you, and that's what. And we're, I think. Yeah. The council needs to do more for our communities, for the children to go. There's, there's no youth clubs. There's nothing. In, 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 where I'm coming from, Glasgow, there ain't even a park for them. They need to do more. The council needs to do more. Thank you, Councillor Wade. Um, do we have any more comments or questions? No? Right, so the report includes the following recommendation. That members review the report and raise any questions, which I think we've done, in relation to the content with the Assistant Director Partnerships in collaboration with the Portfolio Holder for Regulatory and Community Safety. And that the committee endorse this report. Can I have a vote of in favour, please? Those in favour? Oh, a mover and a second, a sorry. Oh, take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll endorse that recommendation. Thank you very much both for coming along and thank you, Steve, for, for sharing that. Um, and we'll look forward to um, seeing you again in six months. <laughs> oh, no, not Steve. Not Steph, no. <laughs> Good luck, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Good night. So we move back on to the agenda, on to item four, update from the chair. Um, this is just a reminder that Jo Sands and Karen Clancy have organised the voluntary sector members seminar for everybody, for all councillors tomorrow. Um, I believe that's in the assembly room, is that right? Yep. Um, so there'll be lots of partners from voluntary sectors that have been invited, so I think that would be a very useful thing to go along to for, for all councillors, not just this committee. Um, and the other one I just wanted to share with you is um, we have a work plan item, mental wellbeing, and I just wanted to give you a little brief update on that one. Um, we've received updates from the MPFT on the work they are doing across Staffordshire and more specifically locally here in Tamworth. And I've had some discussions with executive directors, assistant directors and the, the leader um, to discuss the work plan item um, and we, how we're going to progress through this municipal year and beyond. So at the November meeting, following the voluntary sector 
seminars tomorrow I propose that we have an agenda item to discuss how to take this forward and to set up any working groups and further sessions required I just wanted to share that with you at the moment I don't know if anybody's got any questions at the moment okay so move on to item five uh, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, of which there are none. Item 6, consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council, of which there are none. Uh, item 7, update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. Um, I think there was... Um, an attachment to the agenda which provides the overview of the staff's meeting held on the 20th of September um, and the next meeting I'm due to attend is not until the 25th of October. Um, I really don't have anything to add to that, I'm, I'm assuming all the, um, all the members have had access to that and if you've got any questions then certainly either ask me now or send me an email and I can try and look at those for you. Right, item 10, forward plan. Um, I've had a look at the, the forward plan. Um, I couldn't see anything in particular on there that I think we need to consider, but I'm obviously open to members if anybody else feels that there is. No? Okay. Um, item 11, Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Work Plan. So we've, the next meeting is on the 30th of November and we're expecting Assistant Director for Operations and Leisure to attend and provide us an update on their activities. Um, the, um, the item on the mental wellbeing, um, with the great help of the scrutiny officer have been putting together um, a scoping document that tries to set out the aims and obviously the um, the objectives of what we're trying to achieve because I just felt that got a little bit lost along the way or maybe we just got we've got this mental well-being issue on the agenda on the I the forward plan on the work plan sorry but we need to get some sort of objectives out of it. So I'll just probably share that document with you at the next meeting with the potential for us setting up small working groups so that we can take the item forward and get something, some meat on the bones properly, if that's acceptable. Um, I think that's that's it. I think the end of the meeting. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions or comments or suggestions. No. So I look forward to seeing you all at the seminar tomorrow evening, which I think is at six o'clock. Thank you, and I now close the meeting. The time is forty-one.